We live in a technological age of complex machines, and they have allowed us to do magnificent things. But we've also found out from time to time that their complexity can be their downfall. A flaw in a, in a seemingly small part or a seemingly irrelevant subsystem can have dire consequences. And that's particularly true, say, you're in an aircraft where even a small malfunction can have catastrophic effects. And then it's up to the pilot to try to take a malfunctioning and stricken machine and get it safely back to the ground. And that's what the pilots faced on American Airlines Flight 96, June 12th, 1972. It is history that deserves to be remembered. It was nearly 7.20 in the evening on June 12th, 1972, and American Airlines Flight 96 had just lifted off from Detroit Metro Airport, the second leg on a regularly scheduled flight from Los Angeles International Airport to New York LaGuardia, with stops in Detroit and Buffalo. Many of the passengers departed in Detroit, and the plane was lightly loaded with 56 passengers and 11 crew. The flight commander was 52-year-old Captain Bryce McCormick, who Cydia Smith, the lead flight attendant, described as the epitome of the perfect captain. McCormick had flown the first leg of the flight from Los Angeles to Detroit, and so 34-year-old co-pilot Peter Page Whitney was at the controls. Clayton Burke at the flight engineer station rounded out the flight crew. Both McCormick and Paige Whitney were experienced pilots. McCormick had 24,000 hours of flying time, and Whitney 8,000 hours. But neither had much experience flying the model that they were currently flying, the McDonnell Douglas DC-10. Combined, the two had a total of just 176 flight hours in the DC-10. In fact, no one had much experience flying DC-10s. The model had only begun commercial operations less than a year earlier, in August of 1971. This particular airplane, registration number N103AA, was just the fifth DC-10 to come off the assembly line. The weather was generally good, although visibility was only one and a half miles in the still hazy conditions, and the cloud base was 4,500 feet. Radar confirmed no bad weather between Detroit and Buffalo, a flight that mostly went over Canadian airspace. Conditions were so favorable that McCormick had turned off both the fastened seatbelt and the no smoking signs in the cabin. The plane was climbing towards flight level 230, or 23,000 feet. As they broke cloud cover over the town of Windsor, Ontario, McCormick could see a 747 high above and remarked, There goes a big one up there. In the cabin, Cynthia Smith was on her way to the galley to make coffee. As she later recalled, That's when it happened. The explosion, which occurred just five minutes after takeoff, was so powerful that it knocked Smith off her feet. In the cockpit, the flight crew remembered that the first reaction was that somebody said, Oh shit! The rudder pedals were thrown back so forcefully that Paige Whitney's head was banged against his seat. The rudder had been thrown back in the full left position. The thrust levers all snacked back to the flight idle position, so hard that the throttle made a loud crack. The fire warning bell went off for the number two engine. The autopilot disengaged, its red light blinking. The cabin altitude warning horn sounded that the air pressure had been reduced to an altitude equivalent of over 10,000 feet. The crew was hit with a rush of air, dusting their eyes. It smelled and burned like firework smoke. The captain thought the windshield must have failed, but it was intact. The nose dropped sharply. Paige Whitney uttered what they were all thinking at the moment. We've hit something, he said. The plane speed was dropping, and it was losing altitude. In the cabin, the galley doors burst open, and Smith could see that entire sections of laminated ceiling panels were falling into the passenger compartment, which was filling with a dense grayish-white smoke. Another flight attendant, Beatrice Copeland, had been knocked unconscious and lay trapped in debris. Flight attendant Sandy McConnell felt the floor give way beneath her, and the rushing air started to suck her out of the plane. The plane appeared to be disintegrating from the inside out. She managed to grab the lavatory door and pull herself inside. Still strapped in, flight attendant Carol McGee saw the escape hatch from the downstairs galley shoot up from the floor and strike a passenger on the head. The flight deck door burst open and out flew the crew's hats. While the cabin was depressurized, the plane was still below 14,000 feet, so the oxygen mass did not drop. Smith ran to the cockpit door and yelled, Is everything okay in there? McCormick yelled back, No. He put his headset on and radioed to the Detroit Tower, declaring an emergency. One peculiarity of the McDonnell Douglas DC-10 was that the new design lacked a backup system to operate the airplane's flaps, elevators, and rudder by hand in case the hydraulic system failed. In training, McCormick had been concerned about a hydraulics failure, and so he had practiced on a simulator controlling the plane using its engines when control surfaces like the rudder or ailerons would not respond. The DC-10, with its powerful engines, proved exceptionally responsive in such circumstances. The hydraulics had not failed on Flight 96, but given the loss of so many controls, McCormick's experience controlling the plane with its engine thrust turned out to be critical 
McCormick asked to take the stick and started to test out the airplane, trying to determine the level of damage. The wing engines, engines 1 and 3, were responsive. By increasing power, he was able to counter the rapid descent. Engine 2, in the tail, was still sitting idle, and the throttle moved up and down freely. Clearly, the engine was no longer responding to controls. In response to his call for an emergency, Detroit asked him if he wanted to return to the Detroit Metro Airport. McCormick thought through the options and decided that Detroit, being the closest, was the best choice. He responded, I've got no rudder control whatsoever, so our turns are going to have to be very slow and cautious. The crew had managed to restore some order in the cabin. Flight attendants McConnell and Copeland had freed themselves from the wreckage in the rear. Passengers seated near the damage in the back were moved forward. Lead Lieutenant Smith was able to report to the captain that there were no serious injuries among the passengers and crew, and there was a hole in the plane in the left, aft-hand side of the fuselage. The captain told her to prepare the passengers for an emergency landing. He told the passengers over the intercom, in his most reassuring voice, that the plane was under control and they were returning to Detroit. The gear was lowered successfully, and the tower had cleared an approach. Typically, a flight making such a landing may try to dump their fuel, but the captain decided not to, since the damage to the rear of the plane was still unknown. The immediate problem was slowing the aircraft for a landing. As the rudder was stuck, McCormick needed engine power to keep the jet pointed forward. As the plane began a shallow descent, it started dropping altitude too fast. If McCormick wanted to slow the descent, he had to increase the speed. Countering the rudder meant that the nose was pointed 5 to 10 degrees right. The plane hit the ground at 7.44 p.m., landed as McCormick described it, flat and fast. Racing down the runway, the plane immediately veered right into the grass. Co-pilot Paige Whitney grabbed the reverse thrust levers, throwing the left engine, engine number one, on maximum reverse power, while canceling reverse power on the number three engine right. That straightened the plane, which rolled in the grass parallel to the runway for a couple of thousand feet, before slowly easing back onto the runway. The plane stopped some thousand feet from the edge of the runway, its right wheel still on the grass. There were no fatalities. Flight attendants McConnell and Copeland received minor injuries, as did nine passengers. It was amazing, given the severity of the damage to the plane, that the crew, through level-headed decision-making and handling of the situation, had managed to get the plane back on the ground with no loss of life. Captain McCormick was praised for his professionalism in handling the event. He retired in 1980, died in 1997 in an automobile accident at the age of 77. The National Transportation Safety Board was able to quickly determine the cause of the accident. Flight 97 had not had a mid-air collision. Rather, the latches on the aft bulk cargo compartment door had failed. As the plane was pressurized, the failure caused explosive decompression, tearing off the cargo door, which then struck and damaged the leading edge and upper surface of the left horizontal stabilizer. The cabin was still pressurized, and there was insufficient venting between the cabin and the cargo bay. The pressure in the cabin put too much pressure on the floor, which collapsed. As it did, it damaged or severed several wires and cables that ran to control surfaces of the airplane, locking the rudder and severing control to engine number two, which automatically shut down. The gaping hole and depressurization pulled a hurricane-force wind through the length of the aircraft. The Ontario police found the cargo door and a coffin carrying a body that was being transported in the cargo bay and had been sucked out during the explosive depressurization in a cornfield. Flight 96 had been having trouble with that aft cargo door throughout the flight. It had taken 18 minutes to get the door to close in Los Angeles. In Detroit, it only took five minutes, but the crewman had forced the latch down with his knee. Well, that had extinguished the warning light that was in the cockpit, made it look as if the door was closed and latched, but in fact what it had done was to bend the latching pins. Further investigation found that the DC-10 had been having recurring problems with the latches on that door and had been identified when the airframe was being tested. McDonnell Douglas had issued a service bulletin indicating that the actuator on the latching mechanism be rewired with more robust wires, but it wasn't required, and it's not really clear if that would have solved the problem on Fight 96, which in any case hadn't received that retrofit. The NTSB issued recommendations to address the problem, but in a gentleman's agreement between the FAA and the manufacturer, the recommendations were not made an airworthiness directive from the FAA, and so did not have the force of law. Thus, the recommendations were applied slowly and haphazardly. On March 3, 1974, a DC-10 that was being operated by Turkish Airlines flying between Paris and London also suffered explosive decompression due to the failure of the latches on the aft bulk cargo compartment door. Maintenance records said that all the modifications that had been suggested by the NTSB had been performed on the plane, but inspection of the wreckage showed that most of those repairs had actually never been made. 
In Detroit, the pilots had been able to land the plane, but in the case of the Turkish Airlines airplane, the collapse of the cabin floor had severed all connections to the rear control surfaces and the plane's hydraulics, and it forced the plane to crash, killing all 346 people on board. It was, at the time, the deadliest air disaster in civil aviation history. McDonnell Douglas ended up paying about $18 million in lawsuits to relatives of the victims, and the FAA finally required changes not just to the cargo doors of the DC-10, but to all aircraft that used outward opening cargo doors. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long, and if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.